Hi, I'm John Idell, Pro Vice Chancellor for Health and Life Sciences here at the University of Bristol. Welcome to the next edition of our Fireside Chats, where we explore aspects of the challenge that COVID has posed us uh, as a society with experts who are leading the charge in research to find solutions to those problems. From the beginning of lockdown, there has been significant concern about the impact that the measures would have on domestic, domestic violence and abuse. According to the UN, uh, at least 15 million more cases of domestic violence can be expected uh, this year as a result of the pandemic restrictions that have been introduced across various countries. And our former Prime Minister, Theresa May, has said that the government must pay attention to this and consider the impact of the lockdown on domestic abuse and on mental health as it designs its exit strategy. So why has there been this increase in domestic abuse during the lockdown? And how can the services that we have best support those victims uh, during this very difficult time and these particularly unusual circumstances? To shed some light on this, I'm delighted today to be joined by Emma Williamson, Emma is a reader in gender-based violence and head of the Centre for Gender and Violence Research, and she's also co-editor of the Journal of Gender-Based Violence. Emma, you're very welcome. Good morning. Um, I guess a good place to start might be for me to ask you a bit about your background and um, uh, your work in this field, and then if we could move on to the specific challenges posed by lockdown, COVID and its impacts. Yeah, so um, I work in the Centre for Gender and Violence Research, which is in the School for Policy Studies. Um, and we do research around all forms of gender based violence, um, looking at different types of inequalities and how they can impact on um, people's experiences of abuse. Uh, so domestic violence, uh, honour based violence, forced marriage, FGM, sexual violence, etc. Um, and we do work uh, locally. We work very closely with local ser support services uh, and both statutory and uh, voluntary, um, as well as nationally and internationally. So we have PhD students, for example, from many countries around the world who've been looking at this issue in their own countries. Um, yeah, so, so we do research around all of those issues. Uh, we also have quite good links in uh, with uh, policy makers uh, and commissioners so we do various events and training and, and we work with colleagues uh, across the country and globally um, to contribute through our research evidence uh, to those discussions about how to tackle uh, gender-based violence um, and domestic violence in particular yeah so uh, it's obviously a difficult problem at the best of times. Um, mm -hmm. What have you been specifically looking at with respect to COVID and, and, and what have the, been the particular um, challenges, if you will, that, that the pandemic and the consequent uh, legislation and public health measures have, have thrown up? Yeah, so I, I think when we were aware that, that the lockdown restrictions were probably coming, um, I think many, we were having conversations quite early with uh, service providers about how that would impact. I, I think um, being stuck physically in a, a space with somebody who's abusive um, is difficult, again, at the best of times, but in this situation, people don't have the option of leaving necessarily. Um, in fact, they can leave, um, and the police, I think, and, and government have, have met, tried to make that clear, but initially there was a fear, people felt that they wouldn't be able to leave. I think for what we've seen through those conversations with Women's Aid and, and other organisations, um, people who were in the process of leaving, um, their plans were, were maybe put on hold because they weren't able to move into a new accommodation. Um, in terms of refugees, so safe houses, there's a network of refugees in the UK. Um, and what they've found is that they've had to lock down in order to protect the residents who are there. So many have been unable to take in new referrals into those buildings. So then they've had to source new buildings to take in new referrals. They obviously also have the issues that, that care homes and others have around staff. Um, self-isolating, um, staff getting sick and not being able to cover that. And I think for many of them, there's also the fear that um, whilst lockdown is happening, uh, many victims and survivors will find strategies to cope, but actually post lockdown, we're gonna have a real problem because this situation of being stuck in that, um, that context is, is gonna um, 
I think lead many people to, to make decisions about whether or not that's the right and safe place for them to be. So we've been working with Women's Aid, um, so they've already done a number of uh, surveys of survivors um, and uh, frontline uh, specialist support uh, services across England um, to look at what the, the direct impact is as it's been happening. So it's been a very fast moving um, development since the initial concerns were raised. I think initially the, the policy government response in terms of funding was, was slightly slow, um, um, but that's uh, hopefully been addressed now and so money has been made available, we're still waiting for to find out how that will be uh, distributed. Um, and I think as well, um, some of the concerns are that in domestic violence situations, very often issues around coercive control and in the sense that we've done a lot of work around that with colleagues internationally. Um, and coercive control is about everyday things so it may not be a, a physical assault but, but it's about somebody being undermined and put down and when you don't have the respite of being able to go outside or interact with other people then the the impact of that can 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 be worse so uh, and that can then lead to escalation whether that's physical or other types of abuse so so we've been very concerned, um, as have most services. They've all, most services have also had to change the way they work. So the priority in this kind of work is always about safety. Um, so if you meet somebody face to face, you, you can be um, confident that the perpetrator isn't there, that the perpetrator isn't listening in, that you can have those conversations. And obviously using online methods, that's more difficult. Um, we've also, although calls to the National Domestic Violence Helpline have risen, um, during lockdown, we've there's, there's also some fears about whether or not being able to talk on a helpline is is something that's available to many people. So um, um, people contacting the uh, Women's Aid online chat service, which means they don't have to speak; they can type using their phones. Um, they've risen uh, significantly, uh, certainly over the the first three four weeks of lockdown. Um, so again, it's been about trying to, to get resources to, to fund that and uh, staff those um, calls to, to get the resources where they are. So early on, I had a conversation with Women's Aid about um, how we could help them um, as researchers to, to pull that research together and working with their research team. Um, and we were successful in, in obtaining a small amount of funding from the Elizabeth Blackwell Institute, which has enabled us and them to actually focus some resource on collating that data so that we have a picture of what's happening from lockdown um, and also post lockdown, which again, as I said before, we, we have real concerns about how that is going to um, impact on, on the sector. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so that's really gratifying to hear. Um, I mean, in terms of the university being able to fund your work, obviously not the uh, underpinning challenge. Um, but I, I, I'm interested in some of the observations that you made about, of course, within lockdown, I, I suppose there's, there's, there's the double jeopardy of um, not being able to escape to even benchmark behaviours, if you will, particularly if there's coercion. Uh, as you say, it doesn't necessarily have to be frank violence. Um, it can be undermining behaviours. Um, uh, combined with, I suppose, the, the, the natural psychology to, to readjust the way in which one might view the relationship because this is the new normal. And is it your, is it your concern that there'll then be a flood of... of, of, of uh, abused individuals when lockdown ends or that that resetting of the sort of relationship um, means that, that there will be an undercurrent of, of individuals who won't make the step that they might otherwise have made because they've adjusted in a context where they've not had the chance to um, understand, uh, think, talk through uh, what has happened. I think we may see both. I mean, our, our experience and the experience of frontline services is certainly that when families are in close proximity, where they may normally deal and cope with, with the underlying issues um, and coercion in particular, um, that after, so after school holidays, for example, after the summer holidays, there's always a spike um, and Boxing Day. Um, so helplines are very quiet on Christmas Day because everybody's trying to get through it and dealing with it and, and Boxing Day um, th there tends to be a spike. So uh, from our experience we think there will be a spike. Obviously there'll be some people who um, um, when it gets back to normal and, and that might feel like a relief in itself 
Um, but I think, think the main thing is that most people in that situation do have coping strategies and they are using those to the best of their ability. I think one of the concerns is about how the issue of COVID itself can be used in, in coercive ways. So victims saying that um, the perpetrator isn't social isolating, for example, and is coming back into the house and putting them and the children at risk especially if they have underlying health conditions or children have underlying health conditions. And, you know, that also includes some health workers who may also be perpetrators who are going out to work in, and, and not protecting the family when they come back because that's not what they do. Um, and also health victims and survivors who may be health workers who have been persuaded not to go into work and then been put in quite difficult financial situations. So I think there are... Um, ways in which lockdown is being used as a, a as a way to further abuse people or keep people trapped um, so that people aren't leaving or, or certainly in child contact arrangements children aren't being returned or there's fears that victim survivors have that if they get ill uh, where are the children going to go and also as well I suppose in relation to that you know we do need to remember that in many cases children are present in these houses so it's not just about the adults in the house children will also be um, witnessing this increased tension um, yeah. and abuse in that situation so and the children aren't going to school so there's no respite there where there would normally be and, and people to watch out for that so I think again it's, it's worth saying that you know we are my colleagues school for policy studies are also doing work around they work with social workers they're looking at child protection they're looking at how to protect children vulnerable children in this situation as well as those with disabilities and underlying health issues um, so I suppose what we're concerned about as well is that kind of fundamental inequalities are going to interact with these issues and have a disproportionate impact on certain groups in society, whether that's yeah. abuse, especially in, around uh, ethnicity as well. Yeah. Um, because often um, certain groups in society live in poorer housing, they're, they're closer together, that uh, experience more poverty. So, so those things have, have a disproportionate impact on, on them. So we're very concerned that, especially from a research point of view, that the data that we're able to collect is able to look at some of those uh, specifics so that we can try and target interventions and services with service providers and policy makers to make sure that we can reach those people who need it. Yeah. yeah. And, and I guess um, I, I, I found myself um, uh, uh, feeling slightly depressed that of course it is now inevitable that this will be followed by an economic downturn yeah. and economic downturns cause distress disease and death and of course um domestic abuse is, is one of the things that we see rise in an economic downturn also mm -hmm. um so so um uh, not necessarily with that in mind perhaps just simply thinking about lockdown and post lockdown are, are there any specific areas of, of, of policy is there anything that policy makers can do um, urgently to to assist with the problem so I, I think the key thing is to is to get the funding that's needed to the frontline services because right. they're who are going to have to pick this up um, and they're already struggling um, we've, we've lost many services over the last 10 years or so um, which has been documented in research so so that that's a problem I think as well there's also a need to, to also have a focus there on perpetrators so we've written around this um, I'm working with colleagues who work in social medicine uh, doing some work around perpetrator programs and my colleague Marianne Hester just working with colleagues in Europe so they've come up with guidance and looked at how they can support perpetrators so about getting if somebody's in lockdown and they're concerned about their behavior they don't think that they're behaving in the way that they need to that actually they can can get help as well because what fundamentally what we want is for them to change and for them to uh, cease that behaviors uh, and they may need help to do that so it is about ensuring that there are um, escape routes for those that need them support for those that need it including victim survivors perpetrators and children as well and recognizing that certain groups are going to be disproportionately impacted i think as well in terms of sort of broadening it out from the domestic violence issue uh, in terms of gender-based violence uh, uh, those who work uh, tackling uh, fgm um, and also uh, forced marriage what they're saying is that they have a real problem because they work through schools they yeah. work with teachers and local authorities about well who who might be at risk who might be being taken to another country or um 
and they're not able to access that at the moment and there's a real concern about how they're able how they're going to be able to, to provide that certainly you know they're going to be disproportionately impacted because of the way that their interventions work and, and trying to find a safe way to do that is really difficult so again i think we need and everybody's already having these conversations to try and work out how how those specialists can actually do the work that they desperately want to do in order to protect them. because what we might see people then are slipping through the net because they're not in schools and I, I think that in a way is testing to the the fact that we do have quite a good network and um, we do have a lot of services now statutory who work together very well but obviously at the moment those services aren't operating so it's it's yeah. kind of really a, and and how how we can do that um, those conversations are happening with the victims commissioner vera baird and also the domestic violence commissioner and nicole jacobs as well doing some really important work to, to get that expertise and, and to find out where the problems are and then address them quite quickly so in a way you know funding from the elizabeth blackwell institute is enabling us to be part of that conversation and where possible to share the knowledge that we have collating data internationally looking at what's coming through so that those policy decisions can be based on the most recent evidence and and address the the issues that are coming up as they happen yeah um if there's someone who's watching this or knows somebody or even hears about this podcast who is a victim of uh, violence or abuse where can they go for support right now so they can call the police the police are going out uh, and will come out so you can still if, it, if you need to call 999 you can do that um, and i think that was one of the initial issues as i said perpetrators can, can manipulate situations and the idea of lockdown was quite um was used in a negative way but actually you can leave if you need to leave you can uh, it's an exemption in terms of the legislation it, it's acceptable to do that um, similarly if you need to leave to go to somebody else because that's a safe place for you to go you aren't going to be prosecuted if you do that they can call um, domestic violence helpline which is 0800 2000 24 7 um, and they will be able to uh, refer people to local resources or talk through what their options are. And as I mentioned before, there is the Women's Aid um, online chat service, which people can use text uh, or email if that's safer in order to get personal advice about what they may need to do and, and be signposted where they need to go. There are also other resources on the Women's Aid website. Um, specifically around COVID-19. So for friends and family members who may be concerned about how they might be able to support somebody. Um, and again, Col Alison Gregory, a colleague from the university has done a lot of work. She's the expert on friends and family. And, and that's been really helpful because I think a lot of friends and family members are increasingly concerned where they may have previously been able to intervene and currently can't. Um, and, and they're worried about that. So they can access that information. Um, and then the other issues around perpetrators so respect uk is the national perpetrator organization they have a helpline for people who are concerned about their own behavior and they also run the men's advice line so any male victims of abuse who need to to access support or, or speak to somebody can call that and their information is available on the website we bookend these podcasts with a, a slide or two. So I think what we'll do at the end is put mm -hmm. some of those key numbers and web addresses on the on the final slide so that so that people have a reference to them. I think that'd be very useful. So um, uh, sadly, it's time to wrap up uh, the the, um, uh, the Centre for Gender Based Violence, of course, was about I think it was this month, wasn't it? It was going to celebrate its its 30th yeah. anniversary. Yes, next week. Oh, dear. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we shall surely have to find the time um, to meet up and, and celebrate its achievements and, and look forward to a long and, as you've explained, really important future to, in, you know, that, that drives the research that informs policy in these very, very difficult times. Emma, I know you're really busy and I'm incredibly grateful to you for giving me the time this morning. Um, it's been sobering. Uh, but fascinating in equal measures uh, and and I wish you um, everything um, as you as you take this research forward thank, thank you thank you very much thank you